Hey everybody, welcome back for another session here at WordCamp Kent. Uh, our next presenter is Jocelyn Mozak. Jocelyn is going to be presenting on five essential questions to ask on a sales call. Jocelyn has over a decade of experience building, running, and wrangling a WordPress design agency. In addition to her running her agency, she is a mentor and business coach to other creative professionals, helping them to build the businesses that they desire. So with no further ado, Jocelyn, take it away. Thank you. So I have a question, everyone. Have you ever had a situation where you've been on a sales call with a prospect, everything has gone great, you're super excited, you sit down, you spend time, you write that estimate, you send it out, only to discover that your definition of a reasonable budget and your prospect's definition are so far off the mark from each other, it's not even funny? Or worse, you send that estimate and then crickets? Really? All that time? Well, what I want to do is chat with you today about ways you can set yourself up for your sales call, key questions you can ask on that sales call, and then how to craft your proposal. So the only decision your prospect is making when they have that estimate in your hands is what pen they're going to sign that estimate with. So without further ado, let's get started. Now, I have a good 40 slides on this presentation, but I've summarized it down to a quick printable PDF, which is like all of four slides, and you can find that at jocelynmozak.com slash sale. Um, so that way you can just know that that's there, sit back, enjoy, take it all in, make notes, but don't feel like you have to be jotting everything down. All right, let's start off with some ground rules. This is all about the mindset we have and preparation for walking into that conversation. Up, the first thing I want to point out is this sales call, it's not about you. I know, the horrors. Isn't everything about us? But I'll tell you, have you noticed any time you've been nervous? You know, sales call make, makes a lot of people nervous. But when you get nervous about things like sales calls, presentations, all these things, nerves are typically when we're making something about us. But see, here is the thing. We are service providers. And so the sales call is not about us. It's actually our opportunity to learn about them. And so the great thing about that, too, is when, it's not, when we're not focused on us, we can show up and ask the right questions and really listen to what they're needing from the project. The other thing I want you to be aware of when you're preparing for the sales call is realize that you are allowed to say no. Just because they want to work with you does not mean you have to work with them. This is an interview. Both are interviewing each other to make sure it is a good fit. To anyone who has ever had that feeling in their gut that says, oh, I shouldn't do this and done it, we've all learned it the hard way. And so my best advice to you is to always remember, if that feeling in your gut comes up, just say no. Another thing to remember, and Nathan mentioned this in his talk, is when we're speaking on sales call, we are there to talk about what they want, what are their goals, what are their dreams, and why are we doing this project? But we are not there to talk about how we're going to do what we do. That is actually intellectual property. I mean, think about it. If you hired someone to build a deck, he would ask you about how you're going to use your deck, the materials, the style, all of the things that help your contractor understand your goals for that deck. But he's not going to tell you what he's going to do. He's not going to go into those plans. And so it is really none of their business how you will do what you do. What is important is what you're going to do and why it's important you're doing it. And just as much as it is none of their business how we do our job, it is none of our business how they pay for this job. You know, often we can get into conversations with our prospects. We start hearing about where they are in our business. We start hearing about what's going on in their life and our own money issues, our own money stories can creep in. And we can find ourselves starting to make decisions on behalf of our prospect, which we really have no right to do. It is none of our business. We shouldn't be saying, oh, I, I shouldn't charge that much because, you know, they can't possibly afford this. Or I shouldn't offer that package because that's like too much for them right now. Like, again, they shouldn't be able to afford this. Our job as providers is to really understand the value we bring to the table and what it costs for us to bring that value to the table and then meet our prospects at that place and end up telling them, this is what I can do. 
and to see what, what will cost and let them make the decision on what's important to them and how they want to spend their pennies. And as we speak about money and we think about, you know, pricing in our own money stories and our own money issues, I want to let a point really sink in, which was so pivotal for me. If you go out of business, who can you help then? You know, I'd often, I had it, especially when I was early on in my business, I carried some guilt around charging more. I don't know why, but it was there. And I realized that if I can't show up and be profitable, I can't stay in business. And if I can't stay in business, I can't be helping anyone. The other thing I would point out when it comes to money is think about it. If you know a project costs, let's say $1,000, if you were to charge 10% less, how would you show up in that project? Would there be resentment? Would you have to take on additional projects just because you still need to eat? Would you not be able to hire that coach, go to that conference? How is your entire world, and as a result, how you can even show up for that client who's paying 90%, but are they losing more than 10% in your not really knowing what you need to show up in business? And conversely, think about the opposite. Think about if you charge 10% more. Think about the energy when we have those projects where we're just like, oh my goodness, I am so being compensated for my time. Like I am being compensated and some. And think about how the, you show up and how you can really focus on being in service to the clients that are in sort of your arena that you're caring for and all the other things that would become possible that you can attend conferences like this. You know, it's beautiful WordCamp, it's free right now being online, but we all know the reality of in-person conference. We've got travel time, we've got hotel time potentially, we have ticket time, cost, all these different things. And so it's really important that you know what it costs and what you want to charge so you can show up and create the business you want to create. And remembering that pricing to match that business is the ultimate service. Because if you don't, aren't true to that, you're not staying in business and you can't really fulfill your goals and your dreams for anybody. And so those are kind of the mindset pieces I want us walking into the sales call with. Remembering the call is not about us. It's not about us touting how wonderful we are. It's about really understanding what are they needing and how can we serve them. That we can, in fact, say no. Just because we're talking to them doesn't mean this is going anywhere. We can discuss what and why we're in this conversation, but not how we're going to do things. We're going to keep our eyes on our own piggy bank and let them worry about theirs. And so when we enter the sales call, what are some of the key questions we want to be, take, uh, be uh, asking? The first one I absolutely love is why now? I bet you their website has been on their to-do list for a really long time. But something has happened, right? Something has suddenly made it bubble up to the top. And for us to understand the priorities of our customer, and the motivation and the needs and all of it. Why now is a very powerful question. You're gonna find out what is critical to them, what is important to them, what is going on, what their timeline is looking like. You will get so many clues from this question. And you'll notice I've got five key questions I'm gonna share with you this morning. And one of, you'll notice they're very short and sweet because the goal of the sales call is to let them do the talking and for us to do the listening so we can hear what they're wanting and show up and serve us. A next question I really like to ask is, how is your existing site letting you down? You know, um, uh, this again will give you more clues into what's going on because a lot of times we will, if we've done an intake form, we'll see their new website and we'll, we'll see, you know, like, we'll see their, sorry, existing website, right? And we'll look at it and immediately start having a list of things that we see that need to be fixed. But it's really important to understand how they are viewing and seeing the website interacting with their business, controlling their business's success or lack thereof. Again, this is all about clues about how this website is currently fitting into their business and their perspective of where it's not showing up and doing what it needs to do. 
I then like to ask them, how is this new website going to impact your business? You know, one key thing I'm doing in all of these questions is I'm letting them tell themselves and me why now and what the impact is. So we've gone over why now, we've gone over how is our current site letting us down. And so now we want them to lean into this site they are, are leaning towards, their goals, their wishes, right? And so how will this impact your business? What are you wanting from your site? And this is a great time for us to sometimes find out they've decided the path to what they're looking for is this new site, but we're going to listen to their actual goals and say, wait a minute, there's some other things that need to happen or what you're thinking of is, and these are all thoughts we could be having in our head and jotting down on paper. Because again, in, in this call, we're supposed to be doing most of the listening, but really letting them lean into like, how's this going to change things? This is going to change how we show up in business. This is going to change the number of sales we can make, the conversion. And you can even let them lean into that with the financial ROI and the measurements, because we're really finding out what are the metrics of success for this project? Is it going to bring in more leads? How much is a lead worth to you? Wow, that many leads at that type of return for a new a client? No wonder you're ready for a new website. The other thing we can do is ask them, how is it going to benefit their customers? You know, they're service providers too. Whether they're creating, they're actually quote service providers or they're creating products, they too have their business because they are there to serve and show up and support someone. And so as businesses, we can get in ourselves, right? We're thinking about what's in it for me. And they may come to this meeting thinking, I need a website for what's in it for me. But we can stretch them. We can stretch the why of this is so important to make them realize that they're enhancing their site, is enhancing their business, is enhancing their business's reach, is impacting more of the people they are here to serve. And so it really brings in the emotion and the why are we having this conversation today and really letting the client in their own words feel into just how important and transformational this project is to their business. And then asking, so what's the cost of not doing this? So like if this project wasn't to move forward, if the status quo was to stay the status quo, where would you be in a year from now? We've gone through where will you be in a year from now with this new site, but where will you be? And they're like, I'd be stuck right where I am now. That's not good. And so that really grounds in that point of why we are having this conversation. And again, through all of this, we are seeing through their lens what's important to them. Because we already know what we think is important on this project, right? If you've already gotten the intake form, again, you've already looked at the site, you've already done some you know, behind the scenes searching, you're already potentially being like, okay, this is data, their SEO sucks, this is a problem, that's a problem, the next thing's a problem. But that's all our goals for the site. We wanna hear theirs too, and realize that theirs are probably the most important. And we can also bring in pieces of what we're seeing. I'm not saying we don't, but making sure we give the client the maximum airtime because that's why we're having this conversation. It's also actually how they fall in love with us, right? I mean, having the conversation not be about us and letting the person talk makes them intrinsically feel connected and heard. And that's really important because isn't that what we want when we hire a service provider? We want to hire someone who we feel like intrinsically understands our problem. It's the reason I'm going to hire someone to build the deck. I don't want to know how the heck he's going to do it. I simply want to know that he can do it. And if I start grilling him on the how, it's probably because I'm not feeling confidence in his skills. It's just an interesting thing to pick up on. But when you walk into the meeting with confidence, they know you know what the heck you're doing. And that's all they need to know, that you've got it. They, you've, you're hearing them and you've got their back. And the most important part of the sales conversation, well, okay, maybe not the most important. Another key part of the sales conversation is make sure you have the money conversation because they can have all the dreams and you can provide all the solutions. And in theory, this could be perfect. But the money, the investment they're going to make to make this so it's part of the conversation. They may have big dreams. They're about to find out what it costs to accomplish these dreams. 
And then they need to figure out internally, is that investment with that ROI, is it worth it for my business right now? And so this is why as much as we might say to them, you're not a fit, if they end up effectively the outcome of this conversation is, I can't work with you right now. It's not a rejection. It is simply two people saying, this is what working together looks like. And it's a, it moves forward or it doesn't. I have had clients that two years later come back to me and say, I'm ready to work with you now. And I'm like, who are you? But we had a conversation years ago. And they now are in a place where they're like, all right, we know what it costs to work with you. We know, you know the value. And we've always seen your value. We couldn't justify it at the time. But now we can. And we want to move forward. And that's the perfect situation. And that's where when I write my proposal and they see the number, there's no surprises. And so they sign. So one of the ways I do the money conversation is actually to sneak it in before we even get on this call. I'm a huge fan of using an intake form. Now, um, there are some I've seen that are really short and sweet, some that are really complex. It's like most things when it comes to questions and forms, you want to strike that beautiful balance between getting enough information without having them be like, okay, I'm not filling this thing in. And sometimes I'll get a referral where someone didn't come to me through the website. They email me. And what I then do is I send them an email saying, you know, Here's my process, basically. I would love to get a call on a conversation with you and chat about your project so I can better prepare for that call. Here is my intake questionnaire. Has key questions on it, like what's your name, what's your email, what's the URL. Sneaks in a couple useful questions like, how did you hear about us? It's really helpful knowing going into the call, was this a referral? Like, where did you come from? It's a question I often forget to ask, but it's really good to know. I ask them, what made you reach out today? Already starting in the why now question before we even hop on a call. And then I ask them, what investment have you allocated for this project? And I love to do it actually as a drop down. So the way I position mine is if you'll notice, pre selected is $6,000 to $8,000. That's my sweet spot. That is where I love to work, that attracts a certain type of project that I and my team can just knock out of the park every time. If you notice, anything below 3,500 is marked as a mini project, and I don't even go below 2,000, and I may even be bumping up these numbers soon. This tells anyone who's thinking they're going to get a $1,000 website, ah, don't even bother. And that's fine, because don't even bother. We are not going to be a fit. Likewise, I have done sites that are you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, and there are people who do sites that are well over hundred k. Not my sweet spot. And so someone coming to this form is going to see the 10 to 15, they're going to see other, and they're going to be like, hmm, I've got a $25,000 budget or a $75,000 budget. Again, probably not the provider for me. And that's okay. That is, again, not my sweet spot. And so I pre-qualify them before they even get on the sales call because the result of this form is taking them to my calendaring software where they can actually get on my calendar. And then this is emailed to me so I can actually view it before we meet. Um, the other thing I love about it is even if, let's say, they're in my window, if they are, let's say, they see the six to eight, so already I've price anchored what working with me looks like. And so if they go down to 45, if they go down to 35, they kind of already know they're sort of deviating from starting point. And so that's in the back of their mind, and that's okay. And so all of these things are essentially a pre-qualification and sort of getting this out of the way. Now, if you don't have something set up like this, you can point blank ask, what investment do you have allocated for this project? And, you know, some people will tell you, and if they push back, you go, well, look, here's the thing. I work with sites anywhere from this to this range. And the site I make at the low end is not the site I make at the high end. It pretend you're looking for a house, right? If you don't give your realtor a range, you can either be being shown duplexes or mansions, but the only way your realtor can really show you homes that are going to work for you and prioritize your goals is by understanding what you can invest and then saying, what is the biggest, what are the most important things? Let's prioritize those and we're going to see what fit. Now, let's say the budget fits scope. Wonderful. Then all you need to say is, look, you wanted to, you know, you indicated your investment was this. Um, based on our conversation, you know, I think the project is going to very nicely fit in that range. I also see it costing about this. 
and you go to the final question. If you had my proposal tomorrow, and those hot little hands of yours, right, would anything stop you from signing it? And this is an important question. This is where all the things you didn't realize start coming out. Like, oh, I need to check with my spouse or check the budget or I have to check with my, you know, business partner or some other objection like it goes quiet, like something else is up. And that is the time to dig into it, to be like, okay, let's talk about it. Because if we don't have we're, this, this question, this objection, this last thing we haven't talked about isn't going anywhere. I mean, it's the reality. There's something else that needs to be put on the table and spoken about. And so let's have that conversation. Because if we don't have the conversation, what happens? We write the proposal, it goes off, and it sits, and we don't know why it's sitting. And, you know, this, this has to get out. And so this is the great way of effectively saying, look, are we doing this thing or not? If we're not, or if there's still a, a, a question you have, a discomfort, a something, Let's talk about it. Now, what happens if the budget is too small? What happens if they indicated they wanted to spend, you know, four or five thousand and you're like, this is a 10K site, people? Well, then you simply can say, look, you indicated you're wanting to invest around this amount. But for a project of this scope, if we do all the things that we chatted about today, it's going to be more like this. And then pause and shut up. We talk about money, we tend to get nervous, and we tend to fill the space. But really what's happened is you just kind of dropped a little bombshell on their heads, right? They're like, Shit. I want all of this. I've just spent the last 45 minutes going through why it's so important and how it's going to impact my business. So like, I get it. I, I've talked myself into it. And that's what you let them do by letting them talk. You let them talk themselves into it. And just be quiet and, you know, let, let them absorb this because they're going to, at that point, do one of two things. They may decide, okay, I really would have preferred to spend 4000 but you're telling me it's 5500 Okay, yeah, we, we can do that. And then you still go to this question. If you had my proposal, like, great, okay. So if you had my proposal tomorrow, would anything stop you? And you let them answer. And again, if something comes up, you dig in. Now, what happens if the budget's too small and it stays too small? In other words, they're like, look, like, I hear you, I get it, you know, I value you, all that stuff. But look, 4000 is all we have earmarked for this. This is all we can do right now. Um, you know, you're telling me it's 5500 like, We can't do that right now. And you go, okay, I get it. Totally get it. I'm a business owner too. I understand just because that's the goal. But this is what it costs, you know, I get it. You have to decide what, where to make your investments in your business. So here's what we can do. I heard you say that the following things were the most pressing and most important. And I agree with you. You've shared all these goals and all of these, you know, reasons. And I get it like that. You're right. That is the most critical thing in your business. So here's what I suggest. We can tackle that most important thing with the budget you've shared. In fact, we can tackle one more thing. So I suggest we do this in phases. So let's do this key element and this one additional element that will work perfectly with the budget, the investment you guys have allocated for right now. And we'll simply put the other items in a phase two, not a problem. And back to our favorite question. If you had my proposal, now that we seem to be on the same page, we understand the goals, we understand why we're doing this, we understand everything, right? Everything sounds good, we even talked money, everything sounds great. Any last questions, any last words, any last objection? Would anything stop you from signing? And when they say effectively you're at the close of the meeting, perfect. You can expect my estimate tomorrow. And there goes my phone, which I didn't need. <laughs> All right, I'll mute it. Sorry, guys. There we go. Oh, and quick recap. Why now? How's what we've got not working? How's the new site going to really impact our bottom line, not only ours, but the lives of those we serve as well? What's the cost of not doing it? And when it comes to dollars and cents, ensuring that we get through any final objections to this entire process before we get off this call. Because that is really what you need to have the green light, to spend the time 
to write that proposal. So let's dig into the proposal. Now this proposal, I'll just let you know, is loosely based on the proposal that is a free download. And at the very end of my resources tab, I do have a download link for it um, from WP Elevation. But what we're gonna do as we go through writing this proposal is we're going to use the information they gave us in all the questions. We're going to use their language. Because again, what is a sales marketing business situation? It's, it's essentially someone coming to us saying, this is what I need. Do you hear what I need? And so us repeating back to them that we heard them in their words validates, yeah, this person gets what I need. And obviously we need to be authentic providers who can do what we say we can do. And we need to know we can deliver on these goals. But a lot of the language we can use should be theirs. And so my welcomes I have um, for my proposals, I use sort of templates I built up through the years, which streamlines and speeds things up. Um, but I swap out certain sections. So I may very well, my default beginning is like, you know, hello, dear so-and-so. You know, we all know your website needs to look great, but in addition to looking great, it needs to, you know, serve your business and all the things. And this is where you can add in the why now. And so as, you know, basically this is what's going on in their business right now. And so it is critical that we take this website to the next level and change it to achieve these goals so the business, your business can benefit in this way. And we are excited to be part of this journey supporting your business and its future. And then the next section I have on my estimates is the business and customer needs. This is again talking about, you know, what is the new site going to do? What, what are the deliverables? What is the metrics of success for this project? A successful project is one that meets the business and customer needs. So we reiterate the current site is basically not up to par because it's not achieving these certain goals. And the new site is going to achieve this list of goals that will impact the business itself bottom line in this way and impact those they serve in that way. We are reiterating all of the reasons we are doing this right now. And potentially not taking action and not doing so results in this missed opportunity. The third section I have is the project scope and timeline. So this is where a lot of us as developers can tend to almost start and keep our estimate, right? We, we, our brains go straight to like, as soon as we see their site, as soon as we start the conversation, I don't know about you, but my wheels start churning of functionality. How am I gonna do what I do, right? And so this is kind of where you can let a little bit of that in of what you're going to do. But again, this is not about how you're going to do it. This is much more about at a high level, what are the functional pieces you're going to have? I also like to put in the expectation of timeline and the expectation of revisions and things. So what's the project flow? We're going to start with a kickoff meeting and we're going to, you know, the client's going to provide sites that they like and all of those things. And based on that, we're going to run off and we're going to go and create a mock-up of what, you know, the homepage may look like. And that will be delivered within, let's say, one week or two weeks of the kickoff meeting. And there will be, you know, we'll then have a follow-up follow meeting to that and we'll go ahead and we'll, there'll be up to two revisions on that. And then we'll move on to the internal pages. And we don't expect about this amount of time on the internal pages. And along the way, who's delivering what? We will be doing the design, but the client is responsible for giving all of the images and all the content to be used. And we don't actually start development until we have all those pieces. And so it's all spelled out for the client, kind of what high level pieces are happening and when, and what's the expectation of this flow? Do you get infinite revisions? Do you get infinite ideas? Like what, what are, what is the bounding box as, as Nathan likes to do in one of his presentations? I love it where he's got kind of the clients in sort of a playpen, like, okay, here's your box. Everyone gets along if the client kind of stays within the box. And so it's, it's defining what the expectations are for what's the flow and, and who's responsible for what and how's this going to work. It's going to be a development area. It's going to be password protected. You know, this is how I want to receive things. No, you may not give me things piecemeal. Yes, you must give me everything. No, we do not pass go until X, Y, Z has been completed. And so all of those things are there. And then the investment. Again, you notice I'm using the word investment versus even budget and cost and, and all of the things. And so the investment is here. Now, often a customer is going to quickly, um, my proposal is kind of set up um, on an online software and they're probably going straight. It also tracks what they do and I'll share with that. 
is kind of cool. They go straight to the investment, right? They just like, how much is it? But if you've already had the call, the talk on the call saying this is going to be a four to $5,000 project, when they look at the investment tab and see something in the four to five range, they're like, okay, check, we're good to go. Then they go back to the beginning and read through all the pieces. And don't forget to have a sort of a next step. I always put this this um, sort of tab in. Some will just know to go sign. You know, the the um, the investment tab actually has a signature piece on it to basically authorize it. Um, but a next steps, like okay, if you've read through this proposal and everything looks good to go, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to this tab and sign. Then what's going to happen? It might take you to an to a software where you can give you can pay the deposit, or maybe the next thing that will happen is I will send you. You know, you can expect an invoice from me for the whatever the deposit looks like or the first month payment looks like. You'll also receive kind of a kickoff email from me, and then we'll get this show on the road. Can't wait to work with you. And then the final piece, and I have it at the bottom, although I might move it up, is the legal. This is so important. This is the CYA part of it, right? This is where you can add in all of those things, all of those pieces for what happens, you know, where, what happens with imagery, right? Like who provides what? What happens with, with copyrights? What happens with errors and emissions? What are we gonna test on? What we won't, aren't we going to? Um, what happens if the client goes to sleep? All of those things get put in here. So if and when we go there, you are covered and you can say, look, this is what's going on, this is the agreement, and this is how it plays out. And so we start off with the welcome. And one trick I'll give you for the welcome that I love to do, especially if I'm working with organizations like nonprofits, where I know that I've spoken to a point contact, but this may be reviewed by a greater group, is I jump on a Loom video and I do a video just like this and I walk through the, um, the uh, proposal. So what I, I do is I, I hop on and I say, you know, and what it allows me to do is instead of being another, you know, printout on a stack of printouts, I become a human being and I have, I'm able to have that sales conversation with the whole team who wasn't in that room. Because as I talk through my proposal, I do the welcome. I'm reiterating why now? I'm reiterating what the business needs, what the customer needs are. I'm reiterating why it's important. I'm sharing with them what is my processes, what's my flow, what's working with me and my team going to look like. And then I can tell them, you know, and this is the investment and this is your next steps. This all looks good. This is what we do and this is how it goes. And so I found video to be very helpful. Sometimes I put it on my proposals anyways, but definitely if I know a proposal is going to be viewed and decided on by someone who I wasn't in that, wasn't in that sales call with me. I happen to feel like I'm really good when it comes to being in person, that in-person conversation. So if I can't bring them to me, I go to them. And so as far as sales resources, um, I indicated that I use online. You don't need to. Um, I use Better Proposal. I've also used Proposify. The reason I use Better Proposal is I picked it up off an AppSumo deal, which um, to anyone who's done AppSumo, you know you kind of save money and you kind of spend too much money over there all at the same time. But it gives me a template. It's online, which is great. Um, it lets me know if the client has viewed it, which is also wonderful. If I send it and notice a typo, I can quickly jump in there and fix it. Um, it also allows me to see what the customer is doing. So let's say I send off a proposal and then I don't hear anything for a couple of days. And I'm like, ha. Huh. The beautiful thing with the online is if I go in there and I look and realize they haven't opened it, it probably went to spam. And so I can email them again and be like, I said I was going to send you the proposal the next day and I did. Here's the link again, just in case it got caught up in your spam filter. And I, it kind of gives me the, the opportunity to kind of resend. Likewise, if they've been opening it every day for three, you know, for, for the last week, I just kind of leave them alone and I can do whatever I want to do. I can also look at where they're spending a lot of time and be like, hmm, interesting how they're focusing on that. Might, you know, if it's been a period of time, I might send a, an email or a question or saying, you know, um, whatever, but potentially picking up those little nuggets of insight I'm getting into how they're interacting with my proposal. Um, as I shared with you, uh, my proposal template kind of started with the WP Elevation, and I gave a link here to the free one. Legal is so darn important, and um, I actually uh, upgraded my contracts recently 
to use. Um, Nathan Ingram has created a great product called Monster Contracts, and this gives you a good foundation. Now, what I did and everyone should do is take contracts you get when they're given to you in a template form and have someone professional look them over and suggest any edits. Um, but what it does is Nathan knows our business. He's been doing this longer than I have. So all of his contracts for both the um, website build and reoccurring are talking about all of those things like website clients going to sleep. Like a general lawyer wouldn't know all of the gotchas in our industry, but he certainly does. And so he's already added language in there. So you've got a great framework, which saves you a ton of money. But then, of course, have your own trusted legal person put the final stamp of approval. But it saves you so much money having uh, you know, something to start with. And then again, having something that is already so tailored for the lessons most likely, I'm guessing, learn the hard way. Um, other resources. Chris Lama, I really enjoy, uh, he had a recent YouTube presentation called The Three Proposal Options. Um, he likes to kind of, uh, when his proposals with customers, he likes to give them sort of like, this is what we talked about, but like, here's like, the, if we want to go even higher end, and like, if you want to kind of scale it back, he likes to give three options. Um, I personally, what I like to do when I do proposals is I give options through pricing. So I usually will do kind of like, um, if you want to pay in full, it's this price, or if you want to spread it out, it's that price. And I kind of give them a little bit of the financial control through choosing how much they want to pay me via how they're going to sign up with me. I found that to be really powerful when I'm feeling issues around my own pricing. So let's pretend, and I'm just being completely honest with you guys here because I have these things too. Let's pretend I want to charge, you know, $5,000 for a website and I'd never done that before and it's freaking me the heck out to put a number over five. What I used to do, now I've moved into actually payment plans for 12 months. I've got my own new model. But what I used to do to get myself over those pricing humps was I would say, okay, if you pay in full, you get a 10% discount. I'm sorry. Yeah, a 10% discount. So what I, let me, let me backpedal, I'll explain a little bit better. Let's say I always want, I want to charge over 5,000, but I've only charged like 4,800. What I do is I would pick the number I'm comfortable with at like 48 and call that my 90% price. So if you pay in full, here's the price you can pay. And that's kind of the comfort zone price for me. It's kind of the price where I still feel compensated and they feel like they're getting a deal. Now I want to stretch. Now I want to move over 5,000, right? So the 48 is just under. What would be just above? Like, so instead, it could be the two payments of 2,600. And I'm sure my numbers are a little bit off, but you can see where I'm going with this. Like, if I'm used to doing a 50-50, I can sort of do my stretch number that I really want at my 50-50, and then the number like that, my comfort level at the 10%. And so I'm sort of putting ball in their court because I'm kind of comfortable whether they pay me what I was gonna, what I'm used to charging anyways. But I've given myself a path of saying, well, they pick the bigger number. And that's just a little trick. Hopefully I shared that somewhat coherently um, that I've used to push myself off those magic, over those magic thresholds where I'm having trouble spitting out the higher number. Um, so anyways. And then Fresh Books here, Breaking Through the Time Barrier, is just a great read um, on talking again around pricing and value-based pricing and all the things. So that's what I had for you today. It's a lot, I know. Um, I am, you know, Jocelyn Mozak, as she shared, a uh, founder and owner of Mozak Design, a WordPress web design agency based in Portland, Oregon. I also am a business coach and mentor to other creatives and WordPress professionals. And all these slides and actually a recording of this that I made for a different talk are all up and available for you at jocelynmozak.com slash sale. So hopefully there's time for questions. I know it's a long presentation. Do we have any questions that came on in? We do. We had a couple that came in. So um, one of the questions that came up, um, you definitely gave us resources as to uh, your proposal and like where you could get some of those forms and things. Uh, but we did have a question on your intake form. Could you talk about what kind of software you're using uh, or plugin you're using Ooh. to establish that intake form? Gravity Forms. I've used, that's, that's the first form software I started with years ago and I have not deviated. I have nothing but praise for Gravity Forms. Um, but really, that's all it is, is the form software. Um, so use, use the one you know how to use well and easily, but um, really, they'll all, they'll all do it. 
And there's, when they fill that out, do they get a return, um, like a notification that says um, you've successfully filled out the form? Or do they get a customized email back? Or how does that look? What's the workflow on the back end of that? Yeah, so in my case, the way I have mine set up is it's kind of a pipeline to get on my calendar to have the sales call. So step one is you fill out that form. And so that form goes to my inbox. They are taken to step two, which is where I use, um, oh, what's it called? I'm blanking. It'll come back to me. Oh, book like a boss. Anyways, okay. acuity, whatever you want to use to basically where I have um, have my calendar and I have certain windows where I'll do sales calls. And the nice thing about that is, is then you don't have the back and forth to set up the sales conversation. Like my calendar is already there and I've already said a sales call will be this long. So like I've already dictated, here's the choices you have for when you can get on my calendar. And here's the length of the conversation. Uh, and then so they can just comfortably schedule what, what works for them. This also gives me the opportunity to, I mean, the email has come into my inbox. So if I see anything that I know this is not going to be like, forgot the sales call, I've got their email. I can intercede with a, you know, this is not a good fit or whatever. Likewise, um, if they, if it comes through and I'm like, ooh, that looks like a good project and they don't actually get on my calendar, I may follow up with like a hi. <laughs> You know, we all know in business, we have our periods where we're like, um, more clients, please. And our periods of being like, I'm just too darn busy. And so I, I definitely find my sales process. I give myself that flexibility of having times where I might be more on the aggressive going, wanting the clients. And then I may be more in the space of like the client has to hop through more hoops because I'm busy. Great. I think that definitely would have answered the question. Um, another question we have is in regards to the pricing. People found mm -hmm. that... Um, the, the drop down very helpful as to where they yeah. could peg a price. What do you do if a client um, just isn't sure about what things cost? Do you have some way of educating them if they come in a little clueless? Is there some other direction on your website that maybe focuses them better to be able to pick where their budget should go? Um, how do you deal with that? Yeah, no, that is a great question. And so, I mean, there is some truth to um, I think I have an other field. I mean, there are times where someone will just comment in that, you know, like, I, I don't know. And, and so it's, it's having that conversation, right? I mean, so I guess I don't have really a place in my site right now where I talk about like pricing. Yes, the form is already kind of pre-selecting. Um, I personally prefer to work with businesses that are already established and this is not their first rodeo. Um, I tend to find brand new businesses are typically the ones that don't have the budget and actually have the highest need. And that's a, fun, that's, that's a challenging space to show up in and serve. Um, so if, there, if I ask them, I guess if you're saying like, are you saying if I get to the point in the conversation where I say, what's your budget? And they look, they kind of are shell shocked going, I have no idea what this should cost. Yes, that seems to be the nature of the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's where, again, I say, well, I get that. And as I said, I can do websites that, let's say, are 2,000 or 20,000. And at that point, they'll probably be like, well, no, not 20,000. <laughs> You're like, okay, so you do have at least a number in mind. And, and, and then you can be like, you know, so, and that's where that as the, the, the salesperson, then you are like, okay, well, I don't, I don't know. And so you can say, well, so typically for a project of this scope, we're looking about this range. How does that kind of sit? How does that feel for you? And then they'll kind of sit with it. And they can either at that point say like, okay, you know, I need to. And this is where you know whether you're going to spend time writing that proposal. This may simply be this person needs to sit and process and be like, okay, I understand this was a lot more than you guys were expecting. You've gathered the information. You want to talk to your partners. You may want to talk to a couple other people. I get it. Can we put a, a call on the calendar for next week? So like when's, when, should I follow, when should we follow up and just see where you're at? And so you can, you can give them that space. And then you can see where they're at and do almost the, okay, what have you learned in the last week since we've spoken? You know, they obviously now know about what the budget is. Like, here's where we're at, like what's pivoted, what's changed, and let's kind of go deeper into that. Um, and then the other option is to kind of go back and say, well, yeah, we can do this in phases. So again, if you're like, okay, it's going to probably be four to 5,000, they're like, oh, shoot. You can say, well, all right, that was for your dream. We may not be able to achieve your dream, but I did hear in the order of your dreams, there was something that was a major, major important thing to your business right now. And let's talk about what it would cost and how we could do that. Or even if we can't do that, my job as a service provider is to stretch my client as much as they can be stretched in this moment and move the needle forward. We may, as, as web developers, we have this like ideal, like, oh, this 10,000, like this solution would just be perfect for them. 
But think about it. Even if we don't get them to 100%, let's say we move them forward by 60%. Have we not shown up in service and moved their, and helped their business and impacted it and allowed them to keep growing? And so it can be part of a dialogue of just showing up in the dialogue. Um, and that's why I feel like it's so important that all of the questions I had in there to ask but really about understanding their motivation and why they're doing this and what they're needing. If we just bulldoze straight into the solution space of what we do and how we do it, and we're just talking about us, we aren't getting any new information, none. We already know our, about ourselves. Stop talking about yourself. You know, now at the end, towards the end, they may say, you might say, okay, now that we know all the pricing and all this stuff, here's how the process works. And we can start, like, start to give them a peek into, okay, so like we are all on the same page. I get what you need. I get we can all afford it. This is great. So like, here's what it looks like working. Would you want to hear a little bit more about how I work, how I and my team work to show up in service for you? Then you can talk about yourself. Great. Thank you um, so much. That was a, I think that was a great answer. I think that helps people who look for a direction and you're just not even really sure um, where to start. Uh, we're out of time at this point. However, uh, if you still have a couple questions uh, for Jocelyn, you can catch up with her over on uh, the WordCamp Kent Slack channel. Just hit the website at 2020.kent.wordcamp.org. Uh, there's a link right there that says to join the conversation in the Slack channel. Uh, there's a procedure. Just give them a second just to get you in the room. Uh, and then you can find the Slack channel, find uh, Jocelyn, and she'll be able to help you out. Uh, there's also a great opportunity to chat with uh, some of the sponsors today, too. We have both GoDaddy and Bluehost as sponsors. Uh, they have rooms if you're looking to uh, find out some more about web hosting. This is a great opportunity to engage with them one-on-one -on -one and uh, ask some questions and get some answers and see if uh, everything's going for your website the way you want it to. So uh, thank you again, Jocelyn, for joining us today. And uh, we'll have our next speaker up shortly. Thank you for having me. And yes, I'll be hanging out at the GoDaddy Pro space quite a bit this weekend. <laughs>